Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I know there are some people still stuck in traffic and, and will arrive, um, but they can come in and get seated. There are spaces available over there. Um, I don't want to uh, waste any, any more time and, and take precious time away from our keynote speaker today. It's not um, every day that you have a, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate um, uh, that is willing to give a public lecture. Um, and uh, I want you to enjoy our keynote speaker for as long as we possibly can. Um, I think we're, we're very fortunate um, today that we have uh, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi um, as our guest. Um, and the topic, of course, is one that is of extreme interest not only to all of the UN colleagues uh, in the room and representatives of various agencies, um, journalists, civil society, educators, and, and the public at large. Um, I think it is quite clear even from the latest events on the world stage and, and the Summit on Sustainable Development Goals, where I had the privilege to, to be present in September um, this year, um, that while education has been uh, given its own um, goal, uh, dedicated goal in, in the Sustainable Development List of 17, but it is also quite clear that it permeates every other um, goal in, in the list. Um, I think in India, we frequently talk about um, the plans and ambitions and, and strategies for the country, whether it is to eliminate poverty or, or, or skill people or bring manufacturing to India or, or deploy renewable energy or, or any other goal. Um, ultimately, one has to talk about education and skilling. Um, and that, I think, is, is, a, is one of the two or three really crucial and primary goals that India will have on its agenda in the next 15 years, because without a skilled, educated um, workforce, population, young people, the country will simply not be able to achieve the ambitious um, objectives it, it puts in front of itself. And that's why I think the topic today is so um, front and center. Um, and, uh, and that's why it's on the, on the, public, um, on the public speaking agenda today. Um, let me introduce um, our speaker. Um, I see also a lot of our guests have finally arrived that got stuck in traffic. Please take your seats in the back. Welcome. Um, our speaker today um, was awarded the, the Nobel, Nobel Prize in 2014. So this is fairly, fairly, fairly recent. Um, and the prize was awarded for the struggle against suppression of children and young people and for the right of all children to education. At the forefront of the movement um, uh, to end child slavery and exploitative child labor, he has led this movement in, in India as one of the key figures since 1980. He founded the uh, grassroots uh, movement uh, called Save the, Ch uh, Save the Childhood Movement which has liberated more than 84,000 children uh, from exploitation and developed a successful model for their education and rehabilitation. He founded the single largest civil society network for the most exploited children, the Global March Against Child Labor, which is now a worldwide coalition of NGOs, teachers unions and trade unions in over 140 countries. I hope I'm getting the facts straight. If not, you will set the record straight when you take the podium. And uh, his, his efforts led uh, to several important um, global events. The adoption of the ILO Convention um, 182 in 1999 to end the worst forms of child labor. Um, in September 2015, he also succeeded in, in, in getting child protection and welfare related clauses into the text of the Declaration and into the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. So without any further ado, let me introduce and invite to the podium uh, Mr. Kalash Satyarthi. Um, he will speak for as long as he needs to speak, and then we will have a question and answer session. So hold your questions, both uh, members of the press and, and members of the audience, until then. We have planned for a Q&A discussion um, at the end. Thank you so much. 
Please welcome, it's a delight to have you with us today. My dear children and young friends, it's good that you entered before I started speaking because you bring a lot of light and energy and enthusiasm in this room. So thank you for coming on time. Mr. Yuri, my dear friend Shigeru, sisters and brothers, I would like to express my thanks and gratitude to United Nations and uh, its organizations here for inviting me for this important topic. As Yuri, you rightly pointed out that it's not easy to uh, have a Nobel Peace Laureate. The reason being that in my case, so far I have received more than 18,000 invitations, as my people say. <laughs> so it is not the Nobel Laureate's fault, but the demand. <laughs> but uh, many years ago, when Albert Einstein got this, and suddenly became very famous for his great achievement of uh, theory on relativity, people started inviting him too, because it was a great theory, especially the universities, colleges, science and research institutions. <coughs> so he had to go and attend several places every day. One day his driver saw him very tired he said that, sir, you keep on speaking on the same thing every day, so perhaps it makes you tired. He said, yes, but what else, what can be done? The driver said that, sir, I have a suggestion. Those days, in fact, there were not too many cameras as Pandeji is having a small camera and he can take my pictures and then I was also seeing on Twitter that I'm going to come and speak here and so on. So this Facebook and Twitter and social media and smartphones were not invented those days. So most people had no idea about his face. They did not see his picture, photo. They heard the name, they wanted to listen to him and see him by, on face. So driver suggested that, sir, I have learned every single thing which you speak. Every single sentence, every single word. So do, why don't we try? He said, okay, that's a great idea. So he had done some rehearsal and he was ready, more enthusiastic, more energetic because he was not tired as Einstein was. So they went to deliver a lecture. And the new Einstein appeared on the dais and gave a wonderful lecture. People were clapping, standing applaud. All these things happened. Suddenly, uh, a wise man, the professor like him, stood up and asked a question. The new Einstein said that, okay, it's a great question, but I was expecting something much tougher than you. <laughs> it's so simple question, even my driver sitting in the back can answer that question. <laughs> So the poor Einstein was not spared even. <laughs> he tried out this formula. Dear friends, I am coming straight. I am driving straight from Rajasthan, where we have this rehabilitation center for freed bonded child laborers. It's an education center where the girls and boys who are liberated, now changing their lives, emerging as their own leaders and liberators for future. So this morning, five, six hours ago, I was sitting with them uh, in an open space. 
Today, they were also holding a, a meeting of the youth leaders or child leaders from the neighboring villages. So it was a mixed meeting of the children of Balashram and these girls and boys. Uh, one of the girls, her name is Payal. She's about 15 year old. She was born in the same year when the international community has adopted the Millennium Development Goal. When she was 11, her sister and she was about to be married. Their parents and grandparents decided that they are going to marry both of them to two brothers from the neighboring village. Payal, who was the part of a program, what we call the Child Friendly Village Program, which my Indian organization, Bachpan Bachao Andolan, has introduced some years ago in about 400 villages. Ye bache tum log jo aayo beta angreji samajhte ho thodi? Ye, ye wale, nai bache. Tumhare liye thoda hindi mein bhi mein bolunga. Sab log bait jau, jahan jahan kursi hao, sab sab bait jau. Ek aad bacha meri kursi pe aake bait jai, ha jau. Aho dhol ke kona aega chaldi? Jho sab sab pehle aega, wo meri kursi pe bait jai aega. Shabbas. Yeah, yeah, that's why. <laughs> okay, do bhi bait sakte. <laughs> no problem. Bahut, bahut laga. Kya naam hai tumhara? Akash. Or Som. Sonu. Sonu. Kaha, kaha ho, beta? Durga Park. Durga Park. Yes, yes. Angreji to tum yes sir kya rahe ho? <laughs> Ravi mene poochha mein angreji mein bolu to tum hmm kande lage. So this girl who was uh, enrolled in school, and she just started reading and writing uh, four years ago. She was an enlightened girl. And she opposed her sister's marriage and her marriage. And you can imagine in a village community where you have grandparents, relatives, fupa, chacha, tada, nana, mamu, etc. It was not easy. <coughs> to stand up against all those social norms and social customs. She did it. And today, when she was sharing her experience with other children of other villages, several girls stood up in her support and said that if we go to school, education can stop child marriage. Beside other things, they were very frightened with child marriages, that they should not be married at early age. They wanted to stay longer in the family. They wanted to grow up properly, physically, mentally, psychologically. But when they say that education can help them in averting child marriages, that was a clear message that most of these girls who are forced to marry, they didn't want it. Payal stopped child marriages not only in her village, but in surrounding five villages for last four years. No groom and his family could dare to come to marry any girl in the village or nearby villages. She made it possible. <laughs> and recently she was invited to be a jury member in Sweden with none other than the Queen of Sweden who was heading. Queen heads a jury or a committee which confers the world's uh, most uh, 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 known child prize, what they call the Children's Peace Prize or International Children's Peace Prize. 
So she was sitting in the jury on behalf of all children in the world. There were two other girls and boys, but she was one of them. There was another boy today, when I told this group that I'm going to take part in a, uh, in a uh, meeting like this, I was in our Bala Shram, I was coming from there, so one child was 15 years old. So, is there someone who is 15 years old? Are you all small or big? But one day, you will be 15 years old. Will you be or not? Yes, sir. Are you studying? Yes, sir. Is there any benefit of studying? What benefit will you tell? One will tell you the benefit of studying. चलो इस लड़की ने एक लड़की जिसकी मैंने कहानी सुनाई उसने कहा और दूसरी लड़कियों ने कहा कि अगर हम पढ़ लिख जाएं अगर हम स्कूल में होंगे तो हमारी शादी रुक जाएगी तुम लोग शादी कराना चाहते हो जल्दी मैं तो तुम्हारे बराबर था तो सोचता था कितना अच्छा होगा मेरी दुल्हन आएगी लेकिन मैंने चाइल्ड मैरिज करी नहीं बच्चे बाल विवाह नहीं किया तुम करोगे नहीं करोगे। सो दे दूसरा बच्चा वहाँ पर एक था जिसका नाम रमेश है, वो भी पंद्रह साल का था। रमेश वाज लियोड अवे और किडनैप्ड, स्टोलन, वेरी एर्ली एज व्हेन ही वाज फोर और फाइव इयर ओल्ड। फॉर सेवेन इयर्स ही हैज बीन यूज्ड एस a forced beggar inside and outside the railway stations. Later on, he was used by the organized criminal gangs for petty crimes, pickpocketing and so on. And the last year of his journey as a child or as an adolescent was that he has been used as a drug trafficker as well. He was freed by Bachpan Bachao Andulan about three, four years ago. And today, when I said that I'm going to speak in this meeting, he says that, tell them that I am lucky enough to be rescued and to be in school so that I can differentiate between good and bad. But millions of the children, he said, crores of the children in the world do not have that opportunity to be liberated and to be in school. So I bring this challenge from that young boy to all of you. He was born on the year when the MDG was announced and now he is questioning when we all agreed for sustainable development goals. There are so many things in 17 goals. But a major advancement in the people's thinking and the collective thinking is that the development and human rights are interlinked in this future agenda of development. Earlier, the development was segregated that you have to spend money, you have to do this, this, this to achieve a, B, C, D goals, and there were indicators in MDGs. But if you go through all the goals and try to understand the, the, the spirit of it, it combines development with the human rights, but everyone has right to be equal, for instance. Equity is there. Of course, the poverty, hunger, clean water, uh, clean oceans, so many things are there. But if you go through all, then you realize that we are not asking that government, officers, politicians, please give us this. It depicts as these are our rights. Even during the sustainable development goals, the people like me, when I was one of the founders and the president of Global Campaign for Education for 12, 13 years. 
between 2000 and 2012, I and my organization has been advocating strongly that education is the cornerstone. Education is fundamental. If we are not able to achieve education for all, we are not going to achieve rest of the goals. We cannot get rid of poverty. We cannot find the solution to HIV AIDS. We cannot do many more things, workers' rights, unemployment issues, planet, and ecological issues without education. But that time, the language of education was very simple language, education for all. Now, in the Sustainable Development Goals, goal number four, there's very strong language about it. It calls for an education which is inclusive, which is equitable, which is quality. And education is not only for universal primary education, but also it goes beyond that to bring all the adults and children in <coughs> secondary education. So we have to achieve this goal by 2030. But again, when we talk of inclusive education, we cannot leave millions of children behind. When we talk of quality education, we cannot continue with this formality of just learning alphabet and basic things, but quality brings many things in. And equitable education is very, very important and underlining principles. Equity, so that an education which brings girls and boys together, which brings the children of the, the most deprived sections, and it can end discrimination, all sort of inequality and discrimination within the education system itself. We all were hoping that once we are educated, then we can find, we can find solutions to inequalities. But if the education system is not inclusive, it is not equitable, then we cannot solve those problems. Because then we create a foundation where the society will remain uh, discriminated and, and uh, based on inequalities. So these fundamental principles in the new philosophy of education or new agenda of education are incorporated now. But let me also tell you, most of you are aware that today is the world AIDS day as well. I was in Sierra Leone some years ago and uh, sitting in a, in a village or a kind of community. They, they do not call it village, so in a small community. <coughs> poor people, poor children. I was talking about child slavery and child labor. There was a serious problem of child trafficking within the country and from that country to other places. So we were the part of it. We were talking about it. And suddenly I noticed that there was a group of young boys and girls, even men and women. Some men and women were sitting with us and listening to me and others. But a number of women and men were standing in the back. <coughs> they looked like similar. Their faces were same. They were speaking same language. But the boys and girls in one, and in the back, there were some men and women. I tried to find out who are these, why are they standing, why are they excluded? So the community head who was sitting with us in this group said that, sir, uh, these people are not pure because they are HIV aid. Uh, yeah, positive people. So I was asking to this guy that HIV aid positive people, what is, the, what is wrong with that? It's about six, seven years ago. It's not too long. He said, no, if they touch us, if they sit with the rest of the people, then the HIV aid will spread. It's, uh, it's like that. Infection will go. That was the mindset. Even today, in many societies and countries, the people who are suffering from HIV and AIDS, they are discriminated from other people. To begin with, they think, people think that, first of all, their character is bad. 
They might have done something wrong which is not admittable in society, which is not agreed in the common life. They are responsible for some sin, that's why they are suffering from this HIV positive. But about 12, 13, maybe 15 years ago, a gentleman, he was a young guy, maybe 20 years old, he came. Actually, he wrote to me that he wanted to work as volunteer in my office with me. I said, yes, please come. Then he wrote explicitly that uh, he is HIV positive. Can he come here and work with us in Delhi? He was from Malawi. I said, wonderful, you should come. He came from Malawi. He spent a few years with us as volunteer. George was his name. And today, George is heading a big organization in his country and working very closely with UNICEF. He is one of the UNICEF partners, strong partners in Malawi against HIV AIDS. We were in contact with him. And each time he writes, he never remembers to mention that it was possible due to an education. He was fortunate to get education, and that's why he's able to give education for others. My own global campaign for education some years ago conducted a study. We engaged uh, quite professional and uh, academic people beside uh, the, the medical professionals. And he uh, then we found that 7 million cases of HIV positive could be prevented if we are able to impart education for our children. Only the universal <laughs> primary education can help in preventing 7 million cases over the 10 years. So 70,000 people could be prevented from HIV AIDS if they are able to complete their universal primary education. So when we are talking about HIV AIDS, we cannot ignore the importance of education in finding solutions to these problems. There are, not, there are always medical solutions to the problem, but even for the preventive measures, education is the most effective vaccine for HIV AIDS. Now, the sustainable development goals are there. And the big challenge is that, how are we going to realize them on the ground? It should not remain the talk shop. It should not be uh, just the subject of further research and documentation, and research and documentation, and seminars, and conferences, and conferences. We have to create an environment where the ordinary people in the country, the young people like you, chote chote bachche jo hamare saath baithe hain, inko samaj mein aaye ki vikas ki chidiya ka naam hai. Itna itna vikas ki baat ham log sun rahe hain. Jab dekho jab television kholo, koi na koi neta vikas kar raha hai. Achhi baat hai, kya buri baat hai. Lekin chunao tak vikas ke naam par hone lagein, ye achhi baat hai. Pehle chunao aur chizon pe hote the, अब विकास उनका नारा है सबका नीचे भले ही जातिवाद हो नीचे भले ही सांप्रदायिकता हो नीचे भले ही सारी चीजें हो लेकिन कम से कम विकास हमारे नेताओं के जुबान पर आ रहा है लेकिन वो जुबानी विकास कैसे नीचे उतरे जहां इन जैसे बच्चे ये महसूस कर सकें कि गरीबी से कैसे निजात पानी है बीमारी से कैसे निजात पानी है सब सबको रोजगार कैसे मिलेगा पानी कैसे साफ रहेगा समंदर कैसे साफ रहेंगे हवाएं कैसे साफ रहेंगी ये जो बहस अभी चल रही है वहां पर पेरिस में कि दो दो डिग्री सेल्सियस कैसे कम किया जाए इसमें हमारे देश के नौजवानों की और दुनिया के नौजवानों और बच्चों की हिस्सेदारी कैसे होगी ये गर्मी बढ़ रही है गर्मी को कम किया जाए ये कैसे होगा so we have to create that environment by way of educating our masses, our children about SDGs. Otherwise, SDG is a 
छोटा सा पिटारा रह जाएगा जैसे वो हमारे धार्मिक मंत्र होते हैं ना बहुत सारे मंत्र हैं बहुत सारी आयतें हैं बहुत सारी चीज़ें लिखी हम रिसाइट करते रहते हैं लेकिन जिंदगी में नहीं जी पाते सो मैनी ऑफ द थिंग्स वी हैव टू डू इन अवर पर्सनल लाइफ इन अवर सोशल लाइफ इन नेशनल रीजनल एंड इंटरनेशनल लाइफ टू एकम्पलिश दीज सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल्स बट फॉर मी द बिगिनिंग एज इज रिटर्न हेयर इज एजुकेशन आई कुड थिंक ऑफ फोर पिलर्स और फोर पीज इन अचीविंग सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल्स और सस्टेनेबिलिटी ऑफ सोसाइटी एंड डेवलपमेंट फोर पिलर्स और फोर पीज माई वन पी इज people what are we doing so that our people are empowered when india attained freedom and the first prime minister jawaharlal nehru went to mahatma gandhi and asked him that bapu please tell me what kind of policies and programs i should make for the nation gandhi replied in very simple words jawahar sit in a corner close your eyes and bring the image of a person who is the poorest of the poor the last person of society you have ever seen the most vulnerable the most exploited most abused person you have ever seen most the poorest of the poor you have ever seen bring his image on your in your mind and then see that if your schemes and your laws and your planning can bring a smile to the face of that poorest of the poor person the last person of society only then you should sign on it otherwise throw it in basket useless he said empowerment of people bringing a smile to the face of the poorest of the poor in the society is the mantra for development of the country we are the largest democracy in the world we are very vibrant democracy in the world and we should be proud of it i am proud of it for my democracy but we have to see that how the fruits of this democracy trickles down to the poorest of the poor in the country how transparent we transparent we are in our governance do we really accountable to each other and we are do we have a strong accountability frameworks on every box of life not only in the governance but also in our social and personal life do we feel accountable to someone or someone feels accountable to other education is the key to bring transparency and accountability in the society that is first p people the second p is prosperity we have to fight poverty we have to bring prosperity in the lives of everyone but the prosperity cannot come without education skills and technology now we are living in the age of knowledge economy earlier those who have big lands were rich people considered to be rich those who have big weapons and vehicles they were considered to be the richest people and most powerful people but there is a paradigm shift in power and prosperity both and that has gone to the knowledge today when 59 million children in the world are not able to go to schools they have never been to schools another 65 million children or adolescent who have to be who must be in secondary schools they are out of secondary schools so all together 124 million children and adolescents are out of school in primary and secondary classes how come they become an equal partner in this global economy the prerequisite is education and knowledge 
thousands of years ago, the Indian rishis of Vedas had a mantra, the first mantra of Rig Veda, that is supposed to be the ancient, most ancient book of knowledge in the world. It says, Agni Mide Purohitam Yajasya Deva Mrityujam Hotaram Ratnadhatama. That means those who are engaged in the well being of society come together. Ignite the fire of knowledge that could be converted into prosperity for everyone. So the conversion of knowledge created by all good people for the benefit of all people is possible through prosperity. Knowledge converted to prosperity. So in the age of technology, education is the key to get rid of poverty. The third thing is planet. As I mentioned, and a lot of you know, you will keep on watching all this on television uh, for, for next, I think, eight, nine, ten days, how the great leaders of the world um, are negotiating and not negotiating or what they are doing. It's, the planet is on a stake. And the worst victims of ecological disasters, the worst victims of global warming, the worst victims of any kind of environmental deprivation are children. Everywhere in the world, wherever the natural calamities took place, flood or whatever, children become the most vulnerable to leave their schools because their schools are sometimes demolished. In Nepal, for instance, 40,000, 45,000 classrooms were demolished due to this. And these children were sitting in open tents, and they become vulnerable not only for the deprivation of education, but also for trafficking and child labor. So we have to protect planet through knowledge, through education. Technology will play a very important role. How to find the alternate sources of energy? That is possible only through technology. And the most advanced technology, most advanced researches can go only through education. So we have to see that how all our children, all our people are able to get that quality of education. So after planet, the fourth, is, fourth pillar is peace. <coughs> what we see today, what happened in France last few weeks ago? I was shocked to see that one of those perpetrators, one of those terrorists was 15 year old. It was reported in international media. And one of the masterminds had brought his own 13-year-old brother to ISIS to be trained. Sometimes we see in the newspapers that young boys are asked, 10-year-old boy is asked to kill a suspected traitor of this terrorist group. And when that 10-year-old cannot kill it, he's frightened, he, he does not know how to open fire and push trigger. He was told that you would be buried alive. And it has happened in some cases where these eight, nine, ten-year-old boys were buried in a pre-prepared uh, place. Whose children are they? Whose children are they? Four and a half thousand girls and adults and girls who are kidnapped by this terrorist group. And some of them are sold for sexual slavery in a price less than a cigarette pack. And if they are not able to perform, you read in the newspapers, they are buried alive in a prepared grave. Whose daughters are they? Whose sisters are they? We fail to educate our children. We fail to educate the world in giving an education which brings reasoning, which brings 
mutual, mutual respect. An education which is scientific. So the young people who are trapped by those people are those whom we are not able to impart that education which is to be given by these terrorist groups. How can you bring about peace? Peace is not something which is negotiated on the piece of table, on, the, on a table. Peace is not something which, can, which you can just listen in, your, in the preaches by the, uh, the religious and faith leaders in the mosque and temples and other places, churches. Peace is a right of each one of us. But that right to peace can never be achieved without education. So people, prosperity, planet, and peace, everything needs good quality education for all children in the world. Is the world so poor? Is the world so poor? Think for a while, is, is the world so poor? $22 billion annually are needed to educate our children in universal primary. Altogether, $39 billion annually are needed to ensure primary and secondary education for all children. $22 billion is what? Three and a half days of global military expenditure. $39 billion is not a paramount money. It's less than a week's military expenditure in the world. We can educate our children if our children are in priority. Thanks to the international community that before uh, SDGs, uh, as mentioned, I, have, I had worked hard for last many, many years to incorporate specific language about education, specific language about uh, child labor, slavery, trafficking, violence against children, etc. And I'm very happy to say that most of these demands have been included in the SDGs now. So not only in the goal four, but goal number 8.7, explicit language about modern slavery and trafficking and child labor and forced labor, which was not the case in MDGs. Now, in goal number 16.2, there's very clear language about the violence against children, how to prevent violence against children to ensure SDGs. That was not the case before. So now, the international community has recognized. But prior to that, the summit took place in Incheon under the leadership of UNESCO has brought very strong message to the world that at least 4 to 6% of GDP must be spent on education. At least 15 to 20% of the public expenditure should go towards education, besides more th many more things. When we talk of India, we have done great advancement in many walks of life. We are a great country. But it's shocking that when we say with a lot of proud that India is a young country and the demographic dividend is our power, true, 41% of India's population is below 18. And what we spend on this population in their health, protection, and education combined, it is little less than 4%. Not only on education. We are committed to spend minimum 4% and 6%, which has been recommended in many of the, the, the committees and commissions in the past. But we spent only 4%. 
इकतालीस फीसदी लोग हमारे देश में 18 साल से नीचे के हैं बच्चे थोड़े नौजवान और जो हमारी आमदनी है देश की उसका चार फीसदी हिस्सा उनकी पढ़ाई उनकी दवाई उनके रखरखाव उनके संरक्षण सब में मिलाकर खर्च करते हैं तो हमें सोचना पड़ेगा सारी दुनिया को सोचना पड़ेगा इज इट नॉट शॉकिंग दैट ओनली फोर परसेंट ऑफ टोटल ओडीए गोज फॉर एजुकेशन फॉर चिल्ड्रन इन द वर्ल्ड ओनली फोर परसेंट वन परसेंट ऑफ ह्यूमेनिटेरियन एड टोटल ऑफ ऑफ टोटल ह्यूमेनिटेरियन एड गोज फॉर एजुकेशन ऑफ चिल्ड्रन सो एजुकेशन इज स्टिल नॉट अवर प्रायोरिटी we have to work hard for that you have social media you can put the things your demands and your concerns and your anger i would say anger i always believe in anger and i say that we have to be angry for those things bearing in mind that this anger must not be converted into hatred and revenge and violence anger is a power anger is an energy which can take you head a head for the social good so we have to use all this to ensure quality inclusive and equitable education for all our children and that is possible we have done it in last 15 years the number of out of school children according to various statistics has gone down from 130 million to 59 million we were able to make it half we were able to save more than half of our children who were dying before seeing their fifth birthday in last 15 years we were able to do it the number of child laborers has gone down from 260 million or some say 244 million to 168 million in all those years it was possible ilo played very important role and others also played but now when we want to see the success of sdgs we cannot be passive and leave it to the un system leave it to the governments no i i don't believe in passivity and pessimism those who are just clapping from out of the circle out of the playground or sometimes criticizing they never write the history the history is always written by them or made by them who jump in the ring without caring whether they will be succeeded or fail so you have to choose whether you want to sit on the fringe and just wanted to watch what is happening or you wanted to be the partner in it and you can be the partner through the social media in your own way you can raise your voice because voice matters a lot silence is the curse when we see wrongs around us and we don't speak out against it it's a curse If the illiteracy poverty child labor slavery trafficking is happening around us and we just keep quiet then why we live in this world for our own selfishness or self interest and be happy or do something for the betterment of society we have to ask these questions i am not a public speaker though you have invited me to speak like that i am i am an activist i am a very ordinary worker who wanted to see that all children will be in school enjoying playing in their playground healthy children happy children free children that is the only vision that is the only dream in my life that every single child should be free to be a child every single child should be in school every single child should be in playground be free to laugh and cry and jump and do whatever he or she likes every girl particularly and i call upon you to start dreaming this to begin with 
and then slowly built your own conviction that and your own role how, what are you going to do in whatever way you do ye sab hai sambhav chote bacche jab main aapki umar ka tha 5 saal ka 6 saal ka aur pehli baar jab main school gaya school mere liye kitna mahatvapurna hai ki jab main pehli baar school gaya to mere स्कूल के बाहर मैंने देखा कि एक बच्चा जूता पॉलिश कर रहा था वो अपने पिता के साथ हमारी तरफ टुक टुकी लगा के देख रहा था कि हम जूतों पर पॉलिश कराएंगे तुम लोगों ने जूते पॉलिश करते हुए बच्चे देखे हैं कभी देख देखे हो स्टेशन वगैरह पे कहीं कहीं करते रहते हैं ना बच्चे बोलो शर्माओ नहीं तुमको ऐसा लग रहा है जैसे तुम क्लास में बैठे हो तुम्हारी मास्टर नहीं पीछे से तुम्हें इशारा कर रही है कि चुपचाप रहो मेरे मैं तो तुम्हारा दोस्त हूं दोस्त की तरह बात करो ठीक है दोस्त ना होता तो तुम्हें कुर्सी पे कैसे बिठाता टीचर ने बिठाया कभी कुर्सी पर <laughs> किसी नेता ने बिठाया कुर्सी पर इतनी भीड़ में तालियां बजाते रहते हैं सब लोग <laughs> तो इसलिए ना मैं टीचर हूं मैं नेता हूं किसी पंडित ने मौलवी ने बिठाया अंदर कि आ जाओ मेरी कुर्सी पर बैठ जाओ आपके गद्दी पर ऐसा नहीं होता लेकिन मैं तुम्हारा दोस्त हूं इसलिए ऐसा हो रहा है ठीक है दोस्त हो कि नहीं हूं कौन कौन मानता है कि दोस्त हूं बड़े लोग नहीं मान रहे यार तुम मैंने कह रहे यार मैंने क्या बिगाड़ा है छोटे लोग मान रहे हैं दोस्त बड़े नहीं मान रहे <laughs> बड़ों के लिए मैं क्या <laughs> सो जब मैं गया स्कूल तो मैंने बच्चे को देखा और मेरे मन में आया कि ये बच्चा स्कूल में क्यों नहीं है हमारे सबके साथ मैंने अंदर अपने अध्यापक से पूछा मास्टर जी से डर तो मुझे भी लगा जैसे तुम्हें डरता है मास्टर से डर डरना नहीं चाहिए मास्टर से डर मास्टर भी हमारा दोस्त है टीचर हमारी दोस्त है तो मैंने उनसे पूछा हिम्मत करके कि सर ये हमारे साथ स्कूल में क्यों नहीं है और उन्होंने कहा बैठ जाओ बैठ जाओ नए दोस्त बनाओ सब ऐसी बात नहीं पहला दिन है तुम्हारा स्कूल के अंदर तो मैंने हेड साहब से पूछा अपने घर में सबसे पूछा तो सब ने कहा अरे कैलाश तुम क्या बात कर रहे हो ये तो गरीब बच्चे हैं ये तो काम करते हैं गरीबों के बच्चे काम नहीं करेंगे तो क्या होगा चलो बैठ जाओ अपना काम करो पढ़ाई लिखाई करो लेकिन रोज सवेरे जब मैं स्कूल जाता था और दोपहर में लौटता था मुझे वो बच्चे दिखते थे वो ही बच्चा दिखता घर गया मैं रात को सोया तो भी मेरी आँखों के सामने बच्चा कि वो क्यों कर रहा है काम एक दिन मैंने खूब हिम्मत जुटाई और उस बच्चे के पिताजी के पास चला गया पिताजी भी बगल में बैठे हुए थे और उनसे जाके पूछा बाबूजी आप अपने बच्चे को स्कूल क्यों नहीं भेजते तो बाबूजी वो आदमी एकदम डर के खड़े हो गए बोले अरे नहीं नहीं बाबूजी तो आप हो आप मुझे बाबूजी कह रहे हो आज भी आप देखो कि इस तरह के लोग तो ऐसे ही समझते हैं ना कि कोई बड़ी जात का होगा तो बाबू है सब अच्छे कपड़े पहने होगा तो बाबू है छोटा बच्चा भी उनके लिए बाबू है ये जो घरों में काम कराते हो ना आप लोगों में से कुछ लोग यहाँ से जाओ तो फैसला कर लो कि किसी को घरेलू नौकर नहीं रखोगे और अगर घरेलू नौकर कोई बच्चा होगा तो आवाज़ उठाओगे उसके खिलाफ ऐसी जगह पानी नहीं पियोगे जहाँ पर किसी के घर में कोई घरेलू नौकर बच्चा काम कर रहा है ये कुछ तो खुद करना पड़ेगा ना तो मैं चला तो मैंने वहाँ पर पूछा जब हिम्मत करके उसके पिताजी से तो उसने कहा कि बाबू मैंने तो कभी ये सोचा तक नहीं था मेरे तो दादा परदादा काम करते थे बचपन से मैं भी बचपन से काम करता था और अब मेरा बेटा कर रहा है कोई नई बात नहीं है ऐसा सोचते हैं ना सब लोग गरीब का बच्चा काम कर रहा है तो दूसरा उन्होंने जो उत्तर मुझे दिया उन्होंने कहा कि बाबूजी आप जानते नहीं हो कि हम लोग तो काम करने के लिए ही पैदा होते हैं When I met a cobbler boy and his father outside of my school gate, on the very first day I started asking this question. And when I asked this question to the father, he said that I have never thought about it. I started working since my childhood, and so were my father, forefathers, and now my son. Nothing is special. But then he replied that, "Babu ji, sir, you don't know. We are born to work." I could not, I could not forget his 
eyes, his face, his miserability, his pain, his agony. No anger, but deep pain. He said that, sir, we people are born to work. And at the age of five, five and a half, I could not understand that why some people are born to work. Dear sisters, dear friends, dear brothers, I refuse to accept that day that some people are born to work because they are born in a poor family, because they are born in a poor country. And I refuse to accept it here. And I call upon you to reject it, to refuse it. If you see any child is working and not in school, Feel some moral responsibility. Hamadi sabki saja jo mewari hai. It's our collective responsibility. We have power. We have energy. We Indians are not those who were 30 years old, 40 years ago. Today, India is a different country. Let us begin with India. India may be the land of 100 problems. In politics, in society, in cultures, in religions, wherever, corruption. But India is also a mother of one billion solution. Each one of you is a solution. Each one of you is a solution. Don't consider you as a problem or a fence-sitter. You have to go back from here considering that. You are the solution. You are the people who are going to bring every single child in school through a voice, through your actions, through your money, through your efforts, through your power. Whatever you can do, make sure that all children in India are educated children in next five years, not 15 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Spoken like a, a, a true activist. Um, jump in the ring and get it done. Thank you for that. Um, let's open this up for questions. Um, who has a question in the audience? Let's take a few and then, and then right, I see two here and then one in the back. Good evening, sir. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Uh, this is Siddharth from Sri Ram College of Commerce. So my question is to that uh, you have uh, so many uh, uh, fight for the child exploitation, child labor. Now recently your new campaign has started, full stop. Can you put light on that, how you will be reaching to the million of, million of children and million of uh, people in the marginalized like village uh, in the country like India and not only the social media campaign like full stop, how it will be like reaching to the uh, more marginalized and uh, poor people like, uh, against child sexual abuse. Thank you so much. Should we, uh, should we take a few? Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be good. Yes. Young lady. Hi. Um, my name is Nita. I'm from Reuters. Uh, good evening, Kailash. Um, uh, you talked about the issue of um, um, education and expense. Education. Education and expenditure. And uh, I mean, given India, the Indian government's recent policy on decentralization, particularly of social schemes like the midday meal scheme, which has been credited with bringing a lot of children into school over the last few years. Um, are you concerned about this decentralization of funds um, to the states and, and whether that would really help bring more children into school rather than less? Thank you. Okay, and then there was a question in the back of the audience. No? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Dhiren Bhatnaga. Sir, you have told us, uh, told us about four Ps. Could you just enlighten us about the role of population also? What's the role of the fifth P in the present scenario? Okay, good question. Last one, and then we, we go for... Hi, uh, I'm Saurav. Um, I did my college in economics, and I'm working with Teach for India right now. I have a question that you started uh, Save the Child Moment, and then in it, um, you worked for child laws. But don't you think that uh, you, that these laws will lower the wage rate, which they should be increasing? 
which we should work on increasing them before working on their, I mean that it will uh, promote underground economy. Okay. Thank you. This uh, campaign uh, was aiming at the growing scourge of child sexual abuse, not only in India, but globally. But we wanted to uh, launch a pilot project through social media, through Facebook, Twitter, and all kinds of things in India to measure the impact and see. I don't have the correct number, but several million people have participated in it and opposed this. Uh, <coughs> thousands of people have asked, have asked questions about um, what to do. Uh, so we engaged uh, communities, we engaged teachers' organizations, teachers' unions uh, in Delhi, but also in other parts of India, uh, much focused uh, in Delhi. Uh, so uh, we also uh, organized events and activities to sensitize and educate the young people and children, boys and girls both, beside teachers. So that is something which is seriously needed. Like, uh, POXO is a law against child sexual abuse, but unfortunately it has not been properly implemented. Many people will surprise to know that only 1% uh, prosecutions were made in POXO uh, last year. So we have to work hard for, towards the implementation of this, the legally, but also there is a serious need of social awareness and particularly among the young boys and girls uh, in schools and uh, universities, uh, uh, beside uh, in, in uh, mohallas and villages and so on. So we, we wanted to keep it up um, and wanted to continue and seeing the results of it and analyzing the results of the campaign in Delhi. Um, we demand at least 6% uh, of GDP be spent on education in India, uh, because that is not a new demand that has been recommended time and again by the commissions appointed by the previous governments for many years. 6% of GDP must go towards education for children, and that is the minimum. Uh, that is the responsibility of uh, center and state uh, governments both so they have to they cannot pass the buck on each other they have to uh, work hand in hands towards it and make sure that this amount of money is, is uh, being spent on education for children so population um, uh, is uh, I said people I don't see much difference in people and population it's different connotations but we have to empower the people. We have to democratize, democratize our society. We have to, uh, to build a society based on social justice and more importantly on gender justice. Our women, our girls who have been deprived socially, culturally, and, uh, and otherwise economically for years and years, politically for years. This is the time when all girls and women should uh, at least be equal but maybe much more um, advanced than the man. So we have to work hard towards that uh, when we talk of population. And as far as the child labor law, it's, it's, it's an important question because the, uh, the law which is existing for many years since 1986 is an obsolete and a kind of redundant law because it contradicts with the, the two other laws, that is right to education. So under, under RT, all children have to be in schools and receive good quality education up to the age of 14. But the present law allows children to work in almost every occupation except the hazardous occupations. So only 15 to 20 percent uh, occupations are covered under the hazardous occupation which are outlawed since then. But now, after a lot of campaigning and uh, and, and, uh, uh, and demands and advocacy work. Finally, the government had agreed to bring an amendment in the existing law. And more shocking is that this amendment 
is also regressive. It is not a progressive amendment. Because it is, it looks good. Because I, I would definitely uh, appreciate the government's move to enhance the age of employment from 14 to 18. But there are two serious gray areas. According to amendment, all children up to the age of 14 cannot be engaged in any form of child labor, but they can work in the family establishments, and that family includes not only mother, father, sister, brother, but uncle, uncle's uncle, mother, mother's brother, mother's sisters, mother's father's brother, sister. It's the endless thing. So we, uh, as Bachpan Bachao Andolan, and me as person, have rescued thousands of children physically in conducting secret rescue operation, taking the risk of our lives. And each time, or most of the times, especially in some small scale industries, uh, in villages, the employers and the traffickers and the slave masters, they used to claim that they are the uncles or maternal uncles of this child or this group of children. So uh, that, is, that is an excuse uh, which is not acceptable. So in the present uh, um, proposed amendment, this lacuna, serious lacuna still remains. So the children would be allowed to work. And you cannot uh, go for DNA test of every single relative that whether he is a close relative or family member or not. So that is a lacuna. The second serious lacuna in the proposed bill, though the good thing is that the government is asking to, uh, to include uh, the age group of 15 and between 15 and 18 into uh, the, the prohibitive part of uh, child labor law. That means children between the age of 15 and 18 would not be allowed to work. But again, there is a serious lacuna that these children can work in all occupations except three. Earlier, the law which is redundant and useless now, the old law, that has 18, huh? 83 altogether, so 15 or 18, 18 occupations and 65 <coughs> processes. So 18 occupations and 16 processes, ch children are not allowed to be employed now in the existing law. But the amendment seeks only three industries to be prohibited and in rest. So from 83, they are reducing it to three. So we strongly oppose both these provisions in the law. Very good. Um, let's uh, let's have another round uh, of questions. Uh, will be the last four because we also have another activity here that we need to fulfill today. Uh, young man over there, and then in the back, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Harshit. I am also a Teach for India fellow. So, uh, talking of regressive amendments to the RTE, the Delhi government recently proposed that the no detention policy in schools of Delhi should be revoked. And there have been uh, various objections to that particular uh, revocation. However, uh, the government also has suggested that there are very valid reasons for them to do so. But is there a middle path of sorts that can be suggested in order to avoid other following, like other states following the suit? OK. Next question over there in the back. Gentleman with the microphone, thank you. Can you speak up? No. Barely. Just use voice projection. Is it OK now? Yes. yes. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, please be a bit tolerant to um, admit a counter perspective in the sense that uh, uh, would you consider it worthwhile for us to innovate in the livelihoods of the children, making them more resourceful so that they get education while being at work in a certain spirit of Nai Talim, say, uh, which Gandhiji advocated. And uh, would you consider it worthwhile, or is it just a subtle way of continuing the oppression? Uh, again, we talk about education from life while living it. Schools are very sanitized atmosphere in which we do not get the richness of life in the classrooms and so on. And these children also, while working, they get a very uh, quality of wisdom, learning from life, which is a very precious to retain. While, of course, um, 
getting them the school education. Of co also, we want to avoid the monoculture of school education, which prepares children for the market economy. And the traditional occupations which these children have, for example, the cobbler, which you said, along with it carries the values of the family. How to uh, abstract away the child from his uh, oppressive profession and still so that he gets the best of his family values as well as the schooling, both. Good question. All right. Interesting. Uh, no, yeah, there was a gentleman over there in the back. Yes, please, sir. Sir, my name is Anand Gupta. I have spent most of my life in the education sector. I have a question. You talked about SDGs and quality of education. But given the quality of school education in India, would sending children to school alone achieve the intended outcome that you have in mind. We need to improve the quality of education. And what do you propose to do that? Thank you. Good question. I, I don't think uh, the conversation on education is only about schooling. It's lifelong learning. So it's, it's much bigger than that. Um, young man over there in the white sh in the blue shirt. Thank you. Oh, I'm being gender insensitive. Okay, the next one is a lady. Yeah, no. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm from St. Columbus School representing the Nine is Mine campaign. You were speaking about ISIS and those children in who are picking up weapons there in those regions. So but how to reform those children there? So because picking a weapon, I think, is the last solution for them. Because they're not providing education there in those regions. Not even those people are even teaching them something that is corrupted, I, I can say. Or education on their books are just talking about them killing people, that killing a life is a, is a good thing for them. So, so how to reform people in those regions? Okay. Uh, yes. Two ladies over there next to each other. Two questions and then we close. Uh, so we get the gender balance back right. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Deepika. I am a teacher and I teach in a government school. Um, my question to you would be that uh, both... Uh, Jasmine and I, we work in a government school. And every day there are uh, children, exactly like the ones you spoke about, who step in our school. And um, we see the realities, the families they're coming from. And uh, sometimes we aren't really happy with what's really happening around us. So uh, my question to you is that what kept you motivated all these years uh, to, you know, to be in the ring and work? So, yeah. Good question. Um. Good evening, sir. My name is Jasmine, and I've been a government school teacher since the last three years, working with two different NGOs. Uh, so I have, uh, I'll tell you like personal experiences, uh, like one personal experience saying that, say I have a kid who is, um, uh, I ro he ran away he, because uh, his family forced him to work. He was my kid, and I actually got him back. And now, to support his family, he has, I had to find him a job after school, so that because his father is not there, he has an ill mother. Uh, he goes to school in the morning, and then I have to find him a job after school so that he could send money back home, because otherwise he'll have to leave school and go back to village. Where do we find a balance between such situations, one? My second question is that today, when we talk about sending children to school, and being a government school teacher there, seeing the scenario, what do we think about improving the quality in, because it's not just about education, it's about quality education. So what do we believe about improving the quality and say having more teachers, because we see classrooms which have no teachers and they need teachers and teachers are very willing to work, but they are put up with so much of admin work. So there's a lot of, a lot of <laughs> barriers to good quality education in schools. What do we think, what is your view on that? Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, no, I'm gonna close it here um, because there are quite a few questions that have been asked. So let's listen to the answers and then we also have, as I said, another activity that we wanna benefit from the presence of the Nobel Prize Laureate. Thank Go you. Ahead, sir. So um, I spoke about uh, the lacunas in the proposed amendment of child labor law. Uh, not on RT, this is the child labor law issue. Uh, but I don't think that central government is, is trying to amend the RT. Uh, if, you ha if Delhi government is doing something, you can be in contact with my uh, 
uh, people in the organization who are expert on the legal affairs and the education campaigners. But I, I did not hear anything. Uh, I could be wrong, but you please inform me. Uh, the more focus is on child labor amendment bill because that is being introduced hopefully during this session and it is in the priority list. And uh, we have been demanding that the politicians should consider it to uh, pass as soon as possible. Of course, not in this form which is being introduced, but in the uh, further amended uh, form. Uh, this, this, uh, the young bright man, I have, I have a question to you. That what was your grandfather doing? The bright young man who was quite eloquent about uh, the children could be allowed to work and learn. Your grandfather? You remember? He was a socialist freedom fighter. And uh, did he go to school and became freedom fighter or without going to school? So as he dropped out of Kashi Vishwavidyale and joined he, the freedom movement. He has gone to Kashi Vishwavidyale. That's not an easy thing those days. Sure, he so came from a zamindar a, family. So he comes from? A zamindar landlord family. Zamindar landlord family. Upper caste family in Bihar. Upper caste Bihar family. True. And... <laughs> So, but what made him possible to go to um, to uh, Guess. Kashi Vishwavidyalaya and then eventually became the freedom fighter? And we owe a lot for him because because of the people like him, we are free. But if I ask this question to you and all of you, in fact, that if you are you think that this uh, the education and uh, livelihood earning combined or a skill training at the age of, say, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old could be helpful for the society. Could you just take out your own siblings, your sisters, brothers, children, uh, grandchildren from school and send to workplaces for half time and half time you allow them to go to school? Could you do it? Can you do it? Uh -huh. I'd like to say no, but I'm honestly finding it difficult to empathize so, with the situation. So, so that is that. So would it be good to create two rules of law, one for us who are sitting and talking about those good things here, and one for those children whom you call poor children? True. Who is responsible for their poverty? There is no incident in the world where the children have ever created wars insurgencies, violences. There is no single example in the world where children are responsible for poverty and discrimination and caste system and jamidari pratha. Children have never been responsible. It is always adults, we people. True. And now we are creating a, a dual doctrine for them and for us. This is immoral. Thank you. No, the second. <laughs> that is not enough. No. No, <laughs> you need not to thank me. I, 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 will, I, will, I will also tell you that today in the world, we have 168 million children in full-time jobs. Satra crore almost are in full-time jobs. And almost 200 million adults are jobless. 20 crore jobless. Can I say? There is a study, there are several studies conducted in several places, including India, by Gandhian Institute of uh, Social Sciences, Varanasi, which is not very far from your place. So, Gandhi Vidya Sansthan. They have conducted a study in uh, early 90s or so, and they have found that most of these unemployed adults are not, none but the very parents of these children who are in full-time jobs. So the children are kept in jobs because they are the cheapest source of labor, sometimes free labor, sometimes uh, most docile and vulnerable. They can work long hours a day. They cannot go to the court of law. They cannot you know, go on strikes and uh, fight for their rights. So they are preferred over their parents. So the parents remain jobless. They are expensive labor, and they are powerful labor S workforce. They can form the unions and join any union. So that's why the children are preferred. Similar studies have been conducted in Philippines, in Peru, in other places. So that makes a vicious circle between child labor, poverty, and, and, and illiteracy. Child labor, poverty, and illiteracy cause a vicious circle 
which is which creates a con kind of cause and consequence relationship because of poverty you remain poor and illiterate uh, you and you remain you, your children can go to work but if your children keep on going working they will remain poor for the whole of the life so that is the intergenerational poverty cycle if you are not taking them out of child labor and going to give them good quality education that will go on but one figure is good enough to understand that why 168 million children are in full time jobs when 200 million adults are jobless so that is the economic answer now come to uh, the 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 quality issue, actually, there are many indicators of quality, quality indicators, learning outcome indicators, which one can know through, through UNESCO, through uh, the UN systems. Education International has also worked on it. This is the Global Confederation of Teachers Organizations and so on. But the most challenging thing is that how we are going to inculcate the value of global citizenship in education. When we talk of Quality, we have to see that how we are going to inculcate those values of uh, mutual respect and resilience. That is much more needed in education system. And we are all struggling that how we are going to incorporate and inculcate, incorporate this in the whole education systems where the children can learn mutual sharing and responsibility to, towards each other and globally it's not just for india and just not for their village but more uh, open minds uh, as far as the the isis is concerned uh, i i strongly feel that the best defense is the investment on education the most powerful tool to fight Religious fundamentalism, fanatism, and even terrorism is education. Education with moral values, human values, education with global citizenship, which we have not been able to, to impart for our children. If we have been doing in those areas where these children or youngsters are kidnapped and further misused, brainwashed by these fundamentalist forces, then sometimes they are brainwashed to an extent that they feel that if they become suicide or bombers, perhaps they can prove their existence in the world. Perhaps they can prove that they also live in this world. They go to that extent. Perhaps they are going to do something good for the, for the God. So how, how did it go? Because we have not been able to give them more rational scientific education where the reasoning which is the prerequisite which is the very fundamental um, uh, thing in education is not gone to them. So the fundamentalist forces are just grabbing them and using them for their purpose. Uh, so investment on education can definitely help um, in a way. But those who have already gone to that extent, um, it's hard to say what could be done with 20-year-old, 18-year-old boys, or sometimes girls. But why don't we invest now on the children who are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old. And then as he pointed out, lifelong learning is one of the core, um, you know, commitment in this uh, sustainable development goals. It is not just primary or secondary education. So we have to invest on it. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, we have um, um, a little event that we wanted to benefit from your presence. Thank you. As you, um, as you, as you well know, um, there, there is a contest, a competition for young people that's called National Comic and uh, Art Making Competition uh, for young people, and it's on literacy and sustainable societies. Well, it happens to be that today we have some winners, and I wanted to invite my uh, UNESCO colleagues, um, uh, Shigeo Alisher, um, to do the honors, um, not everybody gets a prize from a uh, winner of a Nobel Prize. There you go. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Kailash, um, whom I know for many years before I joined UNESCO 1996. And nowadays, I thrilled. I don't know how to call Sir Kailash, Mr. Satyati. <laughs> but I think uh, that is a great thing, uh, a person who actually proved with his life there is a passion to look after the children who are actually the future of the nation. 
And in this regard, uh, during months of September, every year, our UN agencies in uh, India and the UNRC's office um, with the leadership of Yuri and his staff, we're organizing activities to support UN Secretary General's initiative, which called Education First Initiative, Global Education First Initiative, JFE. In those months, we actually hold many activities around, and one of the activities we wanted uh, Kailash to be with us, but as he said, he was on so much demand, especially first demand was he was in New York during the uh, uh, UN summit, which adopted sustainable development goals. But for that re reason, we actually ask uh, youth uh, aged from 14 to 25 years to send to UNESCO their cartoons, uh, um, comics, in order to reflect new sustainable development goals. And I should tell you honestly that for the first couple of weeks we thrilled, we didn't receive any, <laughs> which never happened in UNESCO, uh, say, history here in this office. Usually whenever we organize any, say, art competition, we get flooding and flooding, say, responses. Then we start looking around and we understand maybe we've been not, say, <coughs> advocating or uh, giving this information widely. But then a couple of visits to the school, you know, talking to children and and, and uh, parents and teachers uh, came to question to us saying, are you sure we understand what means 17 sustainable development goals? And only after UN summit, the media started writing and there had been many references for the head of states to Prime Minister Modi's speech, etc., etc. Then people start understanding, okay, this is a new sustainable development goal should be achieved by 2030. And youth actually said, this is actually our goals not you adults' goals, because these goals will be achieved when we become adults. That's why we will benefit on that. Then we start having a huge number of responses. The international jury, which had been included, the experts on literacy, the educationalists, our UN staff, had been having a problems to find out which one to give a prize. But we went through that, and uh, for example, one of them you see on my behind, uh, and uh, we called here uh, the only three uh, prize winners. Number one prize winner, uh, which is Miss uh, Saranya from Vido Daya Articulation High Secondary School from Chennai. She was <laughs> just arrived. And I would like Kalash to hand over the prize to you. Yes, we need a. Uh, there is a certificate <coughs> and the Thank special you. prize which we think so you what like do you it. Dream nowadays? I'm from Israel. Twelve. And what is your dream? What do you want it to become? Architecture. Architect. Architect. <laughs> good good architecture. Good architect. <laughs> ah, not only architect, but good architect. You can be the architect of the whole country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And she flew all the way from Chennai. She just arrived. Uh, very good. Ago. Very good. <laughs> Our second prize winner uh, is Miss Sara Zahir from Delhi Public School, R.K. Puram. Very good. <laughs> there is a special token certificate and thank the thank prize. Thank you, Sara. <laughs> And I want to pursue art. Yes. I want to be an artist. I want to artist. pursue, yeah. Great. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. So and sometimes a single piece of art mm. speaks a thousand I times more than the speeches great. which we give. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kailash, this actually author of this work. And I'm very sorry for other works. We've been not able to produce it because it's a room size. Come, come. I'll take <laughs> your picture here. with this. I will take your photo. <laughs> I should step out from this. Very good. Very powerful. And you have all this picture. Can I take a selfie with you? Yeah. OK. I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to do it. <laughs> Also, in such a way. I can help you. Take you, you can help you. <laughs> Anisha, I think you might want to help me. <laughs> if you trust me, your gadget, no, no, I can do it. Okay, you will do it. No? She is doing it. She's doing okay. it. And this one. Okay. Keep it between. It Not yourself. Be. Kailash also. And <laughs> 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 I won't. I won't. Do it. Come on. 
Like oh, yeah, come on, come on. It's coming. It's coming. Fine, we'll give you the professional one. <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, se uh, another second prize goes to Miss Malvika Dvivedi, Sardar Patel Vidalaya uh, School from Delhi. Is there any? Where's the price? Yes, there is a price coming. <laughs> Very good. So what do you do? In 12th grade? 11th. 11. 11th. Yeah. Okay, good. And what is your dream? I either want to be an animator or an IS officer. IS officer or animator? Yeah. It's both. Yeah. <laughs> IS officer can also be an animator. Yeah. Very good. And now you, you girls, please come, three of you, and I would like Yuri. Uh, a group photo? Yes, yeah, group photo. Yeah, Very good. Yes. Group photo with them. <laughs> the profile, because yeah. media was. Yes, yes. Oh, oh. We're going we're to give you a lesson on selfies. Meanwhile. <laughs> <laughs> And all uh, prize winners and all works actually available on UNESCO New Delhi website. You can visit and it's available and you will notice that jury made a really hard work to find out the first, second prize winners, third prize winners. Today. Thank you. Yes. And yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a well, the, it is my great pleasure to say, uh, extend my vote of thanks on behalf of UNESCO, firstly to the kids in this room to come over here to listen to Kailash's very passionate speech, especially the, my, the thanks should go to uh, Akash and uh, what is your name? Zono. Zono, who are sitting very quietly with patience <laughs> in front of the audience. And my thanks should also go to the youngsters who are the kind of the, really the hope and the dream of our future. And I, my thanks should also go to the audience, the academics, the officials, the UN colleagues, and the media people. It was a really good moment to listen to our great partner, UNESCO's great partner, Mr. Kairos Satyati. He's been working very closely with UNESCO and other UN agencies like UNICEF, and then the, his impact, the passionate kind of the insightful the message was passed through throughout the world by the, his getting the Nobel Peace Prize last year. It was a very quite happy moment to UNESCO and UN agencies as well. He has been championing education and child rights since he was involved in the uh, World Education Forum in 2000, which took place in Dakar, Senegal. Since then, the, he's been working as the founder and also the great the leader of the world <laughs> Global Campaign for Education, which was the one with the most, the biggest driver of EFA. And these 15 years, the, we have seen a lot of kind of achievements, especially in India. Great number of, huge number of kids are now back to school, and the great number of the adults now can read and write. But still, as Kaila mentioned, we have a huge amount of, and millions of schools, out of school kids in this country, and then as many as almost 800 million adults cannot read and write. It's really, really unbelievable. But the, what I got from his message, the strongest one is, we are, we are the solutions. Billions of us are the solutions for these, addressing these very uh, difficult and, and tough issues. Especially kids, students, 
within the framework of sustainable development, as the Kailash mentioned, education is one of the most important goals which can affect other goals as well. And in coming 15 years, we've seen your growth and your involvement in attaining these goals will be the very wonderful future. We'll make wonderful future. My thanks should also go to Yuli, who, who, who also the very great champion of education, and then the UNESCO has been working and uh, very, with very, very kind of the comfortable situation, and then uh, I really thank his strong leadership in the organizing this workshop. My fi final thanks should go to the uh, audience, of course, and then the, my UN colleagues, and thank you very much for your coming, and then the sharing your questions and then the reflections on how we can address the sustainable development goals in coming 15 years. Truly, education is the fu fundamental the driver for attaining sustainable development goals. But once again, thank you so much. And then the, I really want to have this kind of occasion once again with the cross interaction with you and kids and students. I thank you very much for your coming. I think these two will be... Uh, uh, please join us for tea outside. Thank you.